this is a well-known story in the scriptures. Actually, it starts in chapter 2, uh, verse the, the final verses of, um, of that chapter. With these words. When he was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in his name because they saw the signs he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, would not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to testify about anyone, for he himself knew what was in everyone. It's kind of an introduction to the Nicodemus story. Jesus knew what was in Nicodemus. He knew what Nicodemus was coming to talk to him about. That's why that's why it seems abrupt to us when Jesus answers his question and Nicodemus hasn't even answered or asked a question yet. Now there's there's some things about this chapter we should think about. First of all, we don't know where the conversation with Nicodemus ends in the chapter. Uh, does it end at verse 15? Or does it end at verse 21? That's, that's something that's discussed. And you read commentaries, you'll see that discussion. Um, the words spirit and wind, breath, it all comes from the same word. So the word for spirit and the word for the wind is the same Greek word. That's something you need to keep in mind for this story. In Greek, there were there was a plural you and a singular you. In our language, it's just you. Unless you're from the south and you say you all. Okay? Uh and that is kind of important to this chapter. And the phrase born again, that can either be translated born again or born anew or born from above. Not many of our English translations translate it born above. I have a few. Uh, I think the one I'm using, the New Revised Standard Version, updated edition, and the New American Bible, the good uh, God's Word and Contemporary English Bible, uh, translated anew, but most translate again. Okay, this story is sandwiched between darkness and light. When does Nicodemus come to speak with Jesus? At the end of the chapter, I mean at the end of the verses 21, what does he say about light and darkness? Come into the 
right? And those that come to the light come that they may be seen. Nicodemus, in my way of thinking, and notice I said my way of thinking, is one that is coming to the light. He is one that is coming to be exposed, to learn. Now, he's on a journey. Let's think about Nicodemus for a minute. Um, his name means victory over the people. So think about that. He is a leader of the Jews, which probably means that he was a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council. And we get that idea from uh, chapters 19 and also chapter 7 of the book of John. He's a teacher of the Jews. In fact, he is called the teacher of the Jews, indicating that he was a prominent teacher of the Jews. He was a Pharisee. A Pharisee is one of the major sects of Judaism at the time. The other one that we deal with quite a bit in the New Testament is the Sadducees. Uh, Acts 23 verses 6 through 8 point out some of the differences between Sadducees and Pharisees. But let's just look at it like this. There was probably never more than 6,000 of them, at least during the time of Christ. They were mainly people from the middle class of society. The Sadducees were mainly from the upper crust of society. The Sadducees mainly had control of the priesthood. The Pharisees were what we would say, quote unquote, laymen. They accepted all the scriptures. That means all the 39 books of the Old Testament that we have. They also accepted the oral tradition, which was said to have gone back to Moses. They evolved from a second century B.C. group known as the Hasidim. Now, there's Hasidic Jews today that came about in the 1700s. And that word means pious ones. They were opposed to the Hellenization of the Jews. So they supported Judas Maccabees when he was putting down uh, Antiochus Epiphanes in his attempt to make the Jews Greeks. They supported that. But when the priesthood became pretty much the ruling class and the priest became king, they didn't go for that. And for good reasons. In the Old Testament, as we have it, priests and kings were separated. So theirs was a religious, not political. Uh, that's, that's, they weren't all that political. But at the time of Jesus, they have become a little bit political. There are seats for the Pharisees on the Sanhedrin. And sometimes the Sadducees, even though they don't like it, have to 
side with the Pharisees. There were two schools of thought in Pharisaism, Shammai and Hillel. Hillel is thought to be the most, uh, the more liberal. Shammai is more strict. At least on one point, Jesus agreed with the Shammai school, that concept of divorce. He took the Shammai school. On other matters, uh, idea of salvation that could be extended to everyone, he took the Hillel school. So, uh, that's, that's a little bit about Pharisees. A teacher of the Jews. John 7, 45 through 50 and John 19, 38 through 42 tells us two events from uh, uh, Nicodemus. He defended Jesus in a council meeting saying, uh, we don't condemn a person before we hear what he has to say. You need to listen to him before you make your conclusion. In John 19, verse 39, he, along with Joseph of Arimathea, bury the body of Jesus. He comes to him by night. He acknowledges Jesus as rabbi, which is unusual for uh, for somebody who is not considered to have gone to the right schools or not been trained in the right way. So he acknowledges Jesus as rabbi. He acknowledges that Jesus is empowered by God. He says, no one does the signs that you do unless God is with him. So he acknowledges that Jesus came from God. Um, we can talk to, why did he come by night? Well, maybe he didn't want the others to know he was coming. Maybe that was the best time for him. Maybe that was the best time for him to have an extended conversation with Jesus. Um, so that's that's something. But we also need to think about John's use of light and darkness throughout the book. So Nicodemus comes in darkness, but he is moving toward the light. He is moving toward the light that is the life of men, which is from chapter one. Who was the light that was the life of men? So, so Nicodemus is coming to the light, even though he's coming by night. Uh, you know, we, we, we already talked about this. Uh, uh, you know, he's complimented Jesus and Jesus jumps to the point. He jumps to the point. Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born again or anew or from above. Jesus knew what Nicodemus was all about. He knew that Nicodemus wanted to talk about the kingdom of God. He wanted to know Nicodemus wanted to know if the kingdom had arrived. And there were concepts that Nicodemus might have had at this time. There had been a regathering of Israel. 
there had been a spiritual dedication as such, at least among the Pharisees. A spiritual cleansing, if you will. So all they were waiting for was Messiah. So Nicodemus is wanting to know, uh, are you the king? Are you the Messiah? Is the kingdom here? And so Jesus says, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born again or being born anew. And so let's go back to John 1, 11 through 13 for a moment. Uh, so the second birth analogy has already been introduced in this, in this book. It says, he came to what was his own and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, or of will, or of flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. So all who would receive him were given the power to become children of God or to be born again. Now, Nicodemus seems to understand what Jesus said as a literal second birth. And he says, you know, this is impossible. Uh, how can an old man enter his mother's womb again and of course the answer is no now we might need to put another spin on this Nicodemus may be saying something like this you can't teach an old dog new tricks I'm already old. I'm set in my ways. I can't change. Jesus says, you must be born again. You must be born anew. Now, at this point, if Nicodemus wasn't really willing to listen, the discussion could have ended. But Nicodemus is still interested. He is still listening, even though he doesn't understand. Then we run into another uh, problem with verse 5. Born of water and spirit. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. Verse 6, what is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of spirit is spirit. So what's he mean by born of water and spirit? Now, born anew of verse, what is it, three? <clears throat> verse two. Three. Born anew or born from above is the equivalent of born of water and spirit. Notice where they go. In verse 3, 
You cannot see the kingdom of God without being born again or born anew. Verse 5, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven without being born of water and spirit. Now, the crux of the matter is what does he mean by born of water and spirit? There are at least six ideas that are presented in the various commentaries. And we'll name them. Uh, born of water means physical birth. Of spirit means the second or the spiritual birth. Of born of the Holy Spirit. By the way, you really don't know if of spirit in this chapter is Holy Spirit or the human spirit. Uh, mainly because the Greeks didn't use upper and lower case letters. So you don't know that. We take it to mean that born of spirit means the Holy Spirit. Uh, this is probably not a good uh, interpretation of this. Because the Jews of the time would not have thought of physical birth as being born of water. Now, a few centuries later, this concept is developed in Jewish thought. However, it does make a good connection with verse 6 to take it as physical birth. Well, so much of, for that, that idea. So, let's, let's, let's go back to, uh, to an idea that Nicodemus would have. Nicodemus thought he was ready for the kingdom of God because he was a Jew. He thought he was ready for the kingdom of God because he was a Pharisee. But Jesus is telling him, you're not. You're not. Jesus is telling him, you need to repent. You need to be born again. You need to change. Second idea. So we physical birth. Second idea. Water is understood as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And some translations may read born of water, even the Spirit. Sometimes in the scriptures, water is used as a symbol of God's word. Ephesians 5.26, 1 Peter 1.23. Fourth idea, and this one takes in two concepts. Water is understood as baptism. First, let's think about John's baptism. Nicodemus would have known about John's baptism. In fact, the council had sent some people to talk with John in John chapter 1. To figure out, are you Messiah? And he said, no, I'm not. But in John's testimony, I think that's the right words to use. John 1, 29 through 32. 
Well, let's, let's not go there just yet. John's baptism was a call to repentance. It was a call to prepare for the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And you can look at such passages as Matthew 3, 1 through 17, Mark 1, 1 through 11, uh, Luke 3, 1 through 22. It was a call to repentance. He was the voice calling the people to repentance. It was a baptism of repentance. But notice that in John's baptism, there's identification of Jesus and there's the coming of the Holy Spirit. Now, what am I talking about? In John 1, 29 through 32, how was John going to know who the Messiah was? The baptism and the coming of the Holy Spirit would reveal the Messiah. So, John's baptism... And with John's baptism, or with thinking about John's baptism, it was a call to repentance. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, when they came to John, he had some choice words for them. You brood of vipers, who has warned you to flee the wrath of God. They thought they had no need of repentance. Now, those bad Jews do. Gentiles, well, maybe. Maybe they can become Jews. And by the way, that was a concept in that idea of being reborn. That if you were a Gentile, you do the purification ritual. You are reborn as a Jew. Ties with the Gentile world are severed. So, Nick, so Jesus, by, by doing this, presumably Nicodemus himself had rejected John's baptism. Now, Christian baptism. Now, again, at the time that Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, he would have not understood this concept of Christian baptism. But since the book of John is written at the end of the first century, AD 90 or so, the church has had 60 years of baptismal teaching and practice. So the readers of the book would have some concept of Christian baptism. Does that make sense? Just as John 6, and I think I can do this, just as John 6 doesn't literally talk about Holy Communion. I think it's connected to the practice of Holy Communion. When Jesus says, you have no life unless you eat my body and drink my blood. So, let's think about some things that are associated with Christian baptism. Acts 2.38, remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
So baptism, Christian baptism is associated with the forgiveness of sins and receiving the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 6, dying to sin and being raised in a new way of life. Romans chapter 6. Galatians 2, putting on Christ or being clothed with Christ. 1 Peter 3. Associated with salvation. And it's not because of water, but it's because of a good conscience toward God based in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Matthew 28, the Great Commission. Baptism is associated with becoming a disciple of Christ. Um, maybe there are other points that I missed. But those ideas are all connected with baptism as you read about it in the New Testament. And then the last idea, and this is probably a good idea to look at too. Jesus used water and spirit, or water and wind, to refer to the activity of God. And we can look at some passages like Isaiah 44, 3 through 5, and Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27, mainly. And uh, that follows the valley of the dry bones. But in that passage, God is said that he's going to cleanse his people. He's going to give them a new spirit. He's going to give them a new heart. He is going to make them alive. Basically, when you read the valley of dry bones in chapter 37, you know, the prophet is told to go prophesy to these bones. And these bones start rattling and there's wind and these bones start rattling and the spirit comes back into them. And they're alive. So we need to think about that. Again, in verse 7, and I guess my time's running out. Uh he, he says, do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. And that's one of those places where the first you is a singular you. I'm saying this to you, but you as a group of people need to be born again, born from above. So Jesus is telling his Jewish audience, Nicodemus, just because you're a Jew doesn't guarantee you access to the kingdom of God. Okay. Any questions, comments up to that point? Huh. Okay. Move on a little bit then. So um, now we don't know we don't know if Jesus is saying when he he goes to uh, oh, he he kind of chides Nicodemus for not understanding what he's being told and Jesus uh, 
does something here in verse uh, 11 that says, well, he talks about the wind and he, he uses the wind as an analogy of the spirit. And as we said earlier, wind and spirit are translated from the same Greek word. And he's saying to Nicodemus, we don't fully understand the wind. We can't track it, or at least they couldn't at that time. We can't track it. We feel it. It blows. It moves on. It's kind of the way the spirit acts. You can see the spirit's action in the life of a person. And we might think about like Galatians 5. That lists the fruit of the spirit. We might think of a person who hears the word, who is convicted and responds to the gospel as the spirit moving them. We can see the results. We may also see it in some action that a person who is a believer does. But sometimes the Spirit's there. He's prompting. He's calling. But he moves on. Maybe he'll come again. Maybe the opportunity has passed. So Nicodemus doesn't understand yet. You can see the effects of the wind, but you can't see the wind. You can see the effects of the spirit, but you cannot see him yet. So we move into verse 11, and Jesus talks about we speak. So is he talking about his disciples that are maybe with him? Or is he talking about the, the other members of the Trinity, the Father and the Spirit? We speak what we know. And you do not receive our testimony. And what's he talking about? Earthly things here. He's talking about what God is doing on the earth now. Time of Nicodemus. To bring about salvation. Which is a heavenly thing. But it's actually happening on the earth now, in the time of Christ, in the time of Nicodemus. God is doing this. He says, if I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? And this seems to be a dig at some of the Jewish mystics who have claimed that they have gone up into heaven and they have heard heavenly things. They have seen heavenly things. But Jesus says, no one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the son of man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. That's a story that goes back to Numbers 21. The people have complained and, and you know, they messed up again. 
And this time, God sends serpents. Those serpents bite, the people die. But there is a way, there is a cure for serpent bite. Moses makes a bronze serpent. He puts it on a pole. The people look at it, and they're healed. Just as Moses put that serpent on the pole, the Son of Man is going to be lifted up. That speaks not only of his crucifixion, but how he is back into heaven. He is lifted up. Do we know that Nicodemus was ever obedient? I mean, is there any indication in the scripture? Not in the scripture. I haven't seen it. But uh, there seems to be hope there. We don't know. He is one that keeps coming to the light. Um, John 19 may indicate that he became a open believer at some point. Because he comes and he uh, buries the body of of Jesus. Yes. Denouncing himself as a Pharisee or being at least be persecuted by the Yeah. So let's uh, kind of do some things with John three sixteen. Uh, like I said, uh, John 3.15, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. John 3.16 is a famous Bible passage that we, uh, most of us know, or at least get the gist of it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that everyone who believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So, uh, there was one commentator that made this observation. Uh, Morrison suggested that there are three centers of God's love. First one's here. God loved the world. God loved the world. And when we're talking about world here, we're talking about humankind. We're talking about the creation, probably, according to Colossians 1, uh, 20. The cross of Christ reconciles the creation to God. So the world not the world system. The world system is under the control of the evil one. But humankind, the creation, God loves it. So well, not the world, he just means in the world. So he's not talking about what we can be addicted to. <laughs> right, right. So the second center of God, of love, According to this commentary, is found in Ephesians 5.26. I know, 5.25. Christ loved the church. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And then in Galatians 2.20, it becomes even more personal. Paul writes, God loved me and gave his son for me. Sinners of God's love, the world, the church, the individual. I think that's important. You know, earlier on, in this passage, 
Nicodemus thought he knew the way of salvation. He was a Jew. And therefore, he thought salvation was limited to the Jews. But Jesus expands it. Not only is it limited for Jews, it's for Gentiles and all others. So this is the expression of God's love. Those that come to Christ. Those that come to believe. Can be saved. Are saved. Those who do not. Are condemned. Because. Jesus came. Okay. Got to stop. All right. Any questions or comments that you want to make? The comforter, I know Christ said, I know Christ said, how was the Spirit used Jewish? Did they receive the comforter as we receive? No. Until the coming of Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection, in the Old Testament, when you think about the Holy Spirit coming, he enabled people to do things like the building of the tabernacle. He enabled um, the 70 to prophesy. But the problem in the Old Testament seems to be that he enabled for a certain period of time and then he left. And in the New Testament, it seems the concept is the comforter, the Holy Spirit comes to stay. He comes to dwell within forever. Is that Stab at your question. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, thoughts? If not, I think we need to finish. <laughs>